Well, good morning. We welcome you to Germantown Christian Center. Church, let's welcome those of us that are, those that are joining us online. Well, we're glad you're here with us. We're glad you're here with us. And so uh, we'll just remind you that, uh, again, we're meeting in person. If you're watching us online and you would like to be a part of our service, come on. We, we welcome you. We would love to have you in person here at Germantown Christian Center. Um, we're going to be ministering again today. Uh, we started last week about looking at faith and, and what we can do to be able to eschew doubt and unbelief and really embrace the plans that God has for our lives. God has a plan for you. We all know this. But folks, it's not as far off as you think. It's not difficult to, to achieve the will of God in your life. The fact, the fact is what we need to do is recognize how we're supposed to bring it to pass. See, God has his part and we have our part to do. Sometimes, and I think we've all maybe been guilty in some, you know, some form or fashion, we've tried to do God's part. And we expected God to do our part. And, and you know what? There, there, there comes a point in time we need to recognize it's a cooperation that we have. We're co-laborers together with God. So I need to do my part and I need to expect God to do his. I don't need to keep checking on him. I don't need to keep asking, are you doing, are you, are you still, are you, you know, working on this God? I need to trust him that if God said it, he's doing it. Praise God. Well, anyway, last week we looked at about things that we as a believer can do to embrace this lifestyle of faith. And again, it's a lifestyle. It's not something you just pull out when you're, you know, when, when your bacon's in the fire. It's something that we live by. We don't just, you know, decide to choose to do faith occasionally. We live by faith. Because that is, that's who we are. We are faith-filled Christians. By definition, if you're a Christian, you are full of the Spirit of God and you should then thereby live your life in accordance to the, what the will and the wisdom of God is. That means I need to live by faith. I choose to not live by my senses, by my sight, by what I feel, by my emotions. I choose to live by what the Word says and align my flesh, my will, my emotions to what the Word of God says. And so today we're going to look at a couple stories, a couple things in the Word about things that we can do to enhance our ability to walk in faith. Turn it to uh, Genesis chapter 18 just for a moment, if you will. I'm going to use Genesis 18 as a, as a, a backdrop for today's message. Um, many of you know God has a tendency to tell you to do the outlandishly impossible and then shows you how it can come to pass. Have, have there been times in your life when you felt prompted by God to do something that you thought there is no way on God's green earth this is going to work out? You know, and, and you sit there and you realize that you're right. With you, all things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So we need to make a, a, a simple declaration that, you know, when you're tempted to say, I can't do that, admit it. You're right. You and yourself can't do that. But you're not in you. God's in you. Amen. He lives and abides and moves and has his being within you. Amen. And when you say greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world, you're acknowledging that God's ability is greater than your ability all by yourself. Amen. So I, I just want to have you and encourage you to, to just understand, yes, there are some things that are impossible for you. But not impossible for you who are allowing God to work through you. So, so it's okay. So when your mind tells you, I can't do it, say, you know what? You're right. If it's up to my mind, I can't do this. But it's not up to my mind. It's going to be, I'm going to allow the Father to work his good pleasure through me. And he gets the glory for it because I know in me I couldn't do this. But I can do it because God's working through me, his good pleasure. Now, here we have a story about, many of you know, Abraham and Isaac. Uh, excuse me, Abraham and, and Sarah. And we all know that there was a promise that was given to Abraham and Sarah that they would have a, uh, a gift. They would have a baby. And out of this will come a child, which will be the father of many nations. We understand that. Nation after nation after nation after nation. Would, would, and it would just be a wonderful, you know, uh, uh, display of God's faithfulness for a couple that did not have a child. And we know the story and we don't get all the iterations and things, but just enough. The, the point I want to bring this is God has a history of telling you the impossible is really actually possible with him. In Genesis chapter 18, beginning at verse 9, it says here, we'll take up the story halfway now between. It says, where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. And the answer was, she's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year and your wife Sarah will have a son. 
Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. She was eavesdropping. She was outside saying, who, you know, who are these people? They're, they're, they're angelic visitor, visitors, as it were, sent by God. And, uh, and, and, and this, this was being relayed to him. She was listening in, kind of eavesdropping. I don't know if she had a glass to the tent or whatever else. But uh, she was listening and it came up there and said that she was going to have a kid. And it says here, she was listening to this conversation from the tent. Verse 11, you see Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time. And Sarah was long past the age of having kids. You know, folks, there is something. There's two different ages here. There's long past the age that your body tells you. Then there's long past the age that your mind tells you. How many know that you, how many of you come to a point in time when you're like, even if you could have a kid, you're like, mm-mm, no way, no how. There is a reason why it's usually a young person's game, isn't it? Now, in my wife's and I case, we kind of went around it a little differently. I was 40. My wife was, you know, a little bit older than that when, uh, when we uh, adopted our son. And I've told you the story. I was in a uh, Moscow uh, orphanage. And I got a phone call from a pastor friend of mine. He was just checking in on me. And I, he said, where are you? Sound kind of far away. I said, yeah, I'm in Moscow. He said, oh, you're doing missions work? I said, no, no. He said, well, I wanted to say happy birthday to you. I said, I appreciate it. He said, what are you doing in Moscow? And I said, uh, well, I'm adopting a baby. He goes, you're what? Yeah, we're adopting a baby. He goes, Jack, are you on crack? <laughs> he said, you're 40. What are you doing 40 adopting a baby? Don't you know you're 40? I said, I just, you, obviously you called me to tell me happy birthday. I know I'm 40. You know I'm 40. And so, you know, I mean, you know, and it's true. It, you know, I mean, if we probably would have, you know, if we did it when we're 24, we, you know, probably have a lot more energy at times, but we did okay, you know. But you get older, there's certain times now, you know, you're just like, whoa, you know, you just don't have a choice. You got to stay young because you're chasing around a kid that just wants to run around and do all sorts of things. You know, you're the carpool, as it were. But, but the thing about it is your mind tells you, I can't, I don't want to do that. Even if your body tells you, well, you could, but you just don't want to. You've got to realize that when God presents his will to you, you've got to make a decision. You've got to align your want to to do the will of God. Amen. The problem is a lot of times the reason why some things don't happen in life is we haven't oriented our want to to be in line with what God's will and what his want to is. If you, if you and I can't come to an agreement with God, it's very difficult for God to bring his will into your life. You have to say, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Admit it. You can say, you know what? Honestly, Father, I don't have it in my natural self. I don't have it in me. I don't, I don't really want to do that. And that's okay to admit it. But you better right behind it say, but Father, it's not my will. It's your will. And I'm going to align my flesh to be in align with your will and desire for me. See, the problem is if you can't make that jump from what your flesh is telling you to what God is telling you, you're not going to be able to walk in great faith. Amen. You just can't go through the motions. You can't get reluctant. Well, I'll do it, but I don't want to. The Bible said if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Isaiah 119. See, what I'm saying is we've got to align our willingness and our obedience to do the will of God. So, so you, you just got to say, okay, have yourself of a couple of moments where you say, I don't want that. Fine, get, get it out if that's what you have to, to process it. But then you better quickly enough say, well, hey, I'm bought with a price. I'm not my own. So it really doesn't matter what I want. It's really, what does God want? So what does it really matter what I'm, you know, so Father, I'm sorry. doesn't matter what I want. I want what you want. Because I know what you want for me is better than what I even would want for myself. Okay. So what happened here? You know, she, she was laughing. Past the age of having time. Verse 12 says, so she laughed silently to herself. She didn't want to give herself away that she's eavesdropping. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn out woman like me enjoy such pleasure? Especially when my master, my husband is also so old. Yeah, this woman sounds like a joy to be married to. I'll tell you that right now. Anyway. Verse 13, then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Folks, there's a lot of things in your life right now. 
But you're going to have to answer that question for yourself. There may be things you put on the shelf because you're just waiting. You're like, well, you know, it hadn't come to pass yet. And after a while, if you're not careful, dust gets collected on some of those dreams and those goals and desires that you have out there for yourself. And you put them out there, and, you, and the reason why there's dust on them is because you really don't go and visit them. You don't really go and look at them because, as far as you're concerned, it, it, the, the time has passed. And I'm here to tell you something. If it's in the promise of God for your life, then you, it's not old, it's not too past, it's not impossible. So you, what you need to do is to take the time to dust those things off. Keep revisiting them. Keep thanking God for those promises he's made to you. Don't let the devil convince you that you might as well crate them away, put them away, put them in a bin, put them in a rubber made tin, bin or what, because after all that, that you, it, it's past, it's not going to happen for you. Those are lies. Lies meant to defeat you and discourage you because if he can get you to side in with, with, with the devil's will, he knows you'll, you know, the devil knows he'll, you'll never reach and receive the will of God for your life. So I encourage you right now, if you got some things on that shelf of yours that you've you know, maybe thinking about putting away or maybe those things you have put away. Get them back out. Put them on that shelf. Put them in a prominent position right up there on the mantelpiece, as it were. Every time you walk through it, walk through there and thank him for it. Thank him. Father, I thank you for that coming to pass. I thank you for that, that promise you've given to me. I thank you, Father, that, that you have given a heritage to your children. There's something in your mind, something that you're, that you're thinking, you know, I need to polish that off. I need to, I need to move it in a, in, a, in a position of prominence so I can be remembered and reminded of it. Because you know what? With God, nothing's impossible. It says here, the Lord said to Abraham, did Sarah, why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I'm asking you a question. God's asking you a question. Is anything too hard or difficult for the Lord? So say it. Say it out loud. Now say it this way. Nothing's too difficult for the Lord. In my life. Say it again. Nothing's too difficult for the Lord in my life. See, what you're doing is you're setting things in motion. You're saying it. You're setting things in motion. It's like, it's like, a, it's like you're, you're setting the thermostat of your life. Don't think it alone. Ink it with, with vocalization. Say it out loud. Why do you have to say it? <laughs> well, I, I, mean, I mean, if we read the Bible, we know the power of confession. Romans 10, 9, and 10. I mean, hey, listen, even a Baptist would agree with this. The Bible teaches us that with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Yes, anyone, how do you get saved? You believe in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, the Lord Jesus. Folks, that's just using your faith. That's activating your faith to receive salvation. Well, folks... You do the same thing to receive, as it were, to activate your faith to receive anything else that you have need of or what's promised to you. That's why I want you to polish some things off. Put them so you'll be reminded of it, so you can start saying it out loud. Thank you again, Father. So when you see something, as it were, in your prayer life, when you see something, you're, you, it comes across your mind, you thank God for it. Because what happens is we have a tendency sometimes just put things out of sight so we don't get reminded of it. Anybody ever, uh, anybody ever had a bill that you had to pay? And what you do is, and so it's sitting on the counter, but what you do, you just don't want to deal with, so you just kind of put it somewhere you can't see it as if, if you can't see it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> Let me just clue you in right now. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. See, what I'm saying is you need to have a rebuttal. You need to have something to say when something's trying to talk to you. I'm trying to help you all, folks. I really am. So it goes on to say in verse, four, in verse 14 now of Genesis 18. 
Is anything too difficult or too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. You know what God just did there? You know what God just did there? What did he just do there? What did God just do there? Excuse me? He spoke it into being. He basically was doing what he was telling us to do. Use your faith. Speak it. Proclaim it. And expect it to come to pass. Now you see God has a history of this. Because if you look earlier in the book of Genesis. When God created the heavens and the earth. He said let there be light. And guess what? Light came. He said let there be. And it happened. All he's doing is let there be. What I'm trying to get you to do is do some more let there be in your life. Can y'all do that? So he said there, he said about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Verse 15, Sarah was afraid. So she denied it saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, Sarah, you did laugh. Here's the, this is what I'm saying. What is your initial reaction to God's overture in your life? Now, if you might be in a situation where your initial overture is laughing, un disbelief, doubt, whatever, all I'm going to try to tell you is that may be where you are right now. That doesn't have to be where you stay. Sarah laughed. Another words of saying is she scoffed at it. She dismissed it. There's always going to be things in your life that when you, when you have the entrance of the word of God into your life, when God reveals his plan to you, your first initial reaction may be, I don't see how in the world this is going to happen. Because you're thinking about all the stuff that has to be contended with to bring that to pass. In your own little, you know, finite thinking. What we need to put in the equation is God. Does that make sense? And so... Sarah, her first reaction was, you're, you're crazy. There is no way on God's green earth this is going to happen for me. And God said, is that a challenge? If you're going to have a throwdown with somebody and expect to win, it better not be God. Because that's one thing you're not going to win, okay? I'm telling you right now. God is able. He just needs you to cooperate. Just give him some help. Get out of his way. Don't bring an obstacle. I mean, it's like constantly we're putting obstacles before him. And, and I don't understand it because honestly, you probably want what he's presenting to you. Then why are we throwing obstacles in his way? It's kind of like a, you know, uh, have you ever seen a, a, a movie and someone's being chased? And they're, and they're, and they're, they know they're being chased and they, as they're running, they're trying to throw things, a cabinet or something like that, to, behind them so that the person chasing them has to go overcome the obstacle. Maybe they can get farther ahead and get away. Yeah. Folks, why are we acting like this with God and His will? I mean, we're throwing obstacles all the time with our mouth, with the confession we're making, with some of the things we're saying and believing. And, and, and I don't know why, because honestly, we want what it is that God is presenting. And yet, we act like it's not because we come up with all these, well, that ain't going to work for me. And then you try to invent reasons why. I've had people try to convince me that I know what they wanted was what God wanted for them, but they're, they're trying to convince me that it won't work for them. I'm not going to call anybody up. This is years ago, and, you know, and they, they, they live in another part of the country. Um, I am Facebook friends with them, though. Uh, but any anyway, of I'm not going to mention any names, but I had somebody once tell me, that um, that they were upset with 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 the church and everything else and, and things because they said well our church are just it's a church of haves and and this this person said you know we're we're a have not and your church is full of too many people that have I didn't understand this I'm like what and the more I got into it what they were, they were upset with because because we had people that were giving testimony but God was blessing them. Something could happen and they would give a testimony and they were, they thought, well, that things like that don't happen to us. See, it's not because of you being special. It's because you used your faith and believe God. 
And that's the thing that we, we sometimes get disappointed and discouraged and we allow the devil to work that in our lives because we look at somebody else that maybe is being blessed. And you don't realize that, that you know, that if, if there's something that God wants for you, he wants to bring that to pass, but it doesn't just automatically happen. You have something to do with that. I remember I had somebody once tell me, they, you know, that years ago that, that they wanted to get married. And I said, okay. I said, well, what are you doing? They said, what do you mean? I mean, what are you doing to avail yourself to the possibility of getting married? And, and the things they were doing were not conducive to helping you get married. I won't get into specifics because it's Sunday morning, but I'm thinking that's not going to help you. We need to be in cooperation with the will of God in the methods and the ways that he wants us to act so we can receive what he wants for us. And if you've already discounted your ability by coming up with some excuse that somehow it won't work for you, then you forget the fact that the Bible said God is not a respecter of persons. He doesn't have favorites. You are all his favorites. Every one of you. You say, well, how can God have that many favorites? He can, and he does. You, every one of us, every Christian is his favorite. Humor me. Say this. I am God's favorite. favorite. Turn to the person next to you. Tell them, I'm God's favorite. favorite. Now tell them, so are you. you. Amen. (laughs) What I'm saying is you need to embrace that fact. It's It's a powerful principle. People say, oh, that's just... No, it matters. These things matter. See, what we have, have, have failed to realize is that we are, yes, we're spiritual beings. But that natural side really does impact you from living, whether you be in the spirit or not in the spirit. And so what happens, a lot of times you say, well, we need to live in the spirit. We need to, yeah, yeah, but you're also emotional. You also have emotions and feelings and sentiments and desires and these things. And they do affect your ability of whether you're living in faith or not choosing to live in faith. The way you think in your heart matters. As a man so thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you have sold yourself short from the get-go, then your ceiling is a lot lower than what God would originally had intended for you. And for Sarah, she had sold herself short. She laughing her way. There's no way this is going to happen for me. And God let it be known. Oh, yeah, it will. Don't underestimate God in your life. But see, they, you know, then technically they both laughed. Stop laughing. Stop laughing in the face of the will of God in your life. If you want to laugh, start laughing at the devil and start rejoicing and thanking God for his promise. You want to laugh, go ahead, but make sure it's directed at the devil. Yes. Let the devil know, ha, 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 you think you're going to stop me? Yes. <laughs> Just saying, make the choice. Make sure you're not laughing at God and his promise. Amen. 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 Turn to Mark chapter 5 very quickly, if you will. Mark, are you getting something out of this today? These are basic principles that, that, that sometimes just need to remind. Remember, take those things and put them in a prominent position on, your, on the, the mantle of your life, so to say. Get that dust off those things God's promised you. Those things you're believing for. Those things that need to be done in your family's life. Don't give up. Do not cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. Amen. Mark chapter 5, here at verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by that lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there, seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him. Here's what he said. This was what his plea was. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and will live. I love this verse 24. I love this. I love this. 
Verse 24 says this, so Jesus went with him. You get this, folks? Jairus asked, and Jesus said yes. How do I know he said yes? Because what did he do? He went with him. He went with him. He went with him. There was no argument. There was no complaining. Oh, gee, come on, really? You want me to go with you? I mean, I'm, don't you see I've got all these people here? I mean, I'm tired and, and I've worked a full day today. And, and you don't know all the people I had to deal with. I mean, listen to me. You, you know, I, I had 34 blind people I had to heal. Okay? Not to mention that, five of them, I mean, really had bad, bad breath. I mean, my gosh, you had no idea. Then there was the distance and my feet are real. None of that stuff. Why are we so easily discounting the ability of God and not just accepting the fact that Jesus wants to say, Let's go. Something the Lord reminded me was this. He told me, he said, I am more willing to, to, to honor your prayer life and more wanting to honor what you're saying than your dog is when you say, want to go bye-bye? <laughs> Some of you might get that if you have a dog. I say to my dog, Dudley, you want to go bye-bye? That dog is like, whoo, I show him the leash. If I even, it's funny, I could be upstairs and I could just barely open the little junk drawer where we keep the leash. Y'all have a junk drawer, you know what I'm saying, where it's like a catch-all of anything and everything gets in the junk drawer. I mean, you've, you know, you've got everything in there. I mean, from A to Z, just different stuff, eclectic drawer. But I, we, we put our, our little dog leash in there. I open that little thing. If he even hears the door begin, man, that dog's up here. He's like, <laughs> now he's listening. Now it's like he's on heightened DEFCON 2 alert. He knows. Then if he hears the little jingling of that little clasp, he is down there like nobody's business. He, he is wagging that butt of his, you know, the tail. He's sitting himself down. He is all excited. Once that leash goes on, he is ready to go. Anybody have a dog like that? I'm not, none of you have a dog like that. Oh my gosh. Do you have a dog? You do. Who else has a dog that likes to do stuff? Of course you do. Yes. Two dogs like that. There you go. And you look at that and you're like, man, that dog's just ready. It doesn't matter. I mean, you know, boom, 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 boom. God is more willing to help you out than my dog is wanting to go when I said, you will go bye-bye? You'll go out? Man, he's ready. God's ready, folks. He's waiting on, you know, my dog is always wanting to go outside, go for a walk. Oh, we tell him that, you'll go for a walk? You'll go bye-bye? Oh, man, he is all over that. God is all over you. All you do is give him that, that, that overture, that willingness that you're willing and ready and prepared to do what he asked. In this case, God, I'm ready. Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around. And then, of course, you know the story, of course, in the middle of all this, you had the one with the issue of blood. And she got healed. We know that. Marvelous testimony. It all happened. It was great the way it worked out. But then, in the middle of this testimony... I love the fact that Jairus is sitting there. How many times have you ever felt like maybe God forgot about you? He didn't, but how many of you ever felt like he did sometimes? You prayed about something, and you're just kind of waiting like, okay, it hadn't happened. Anybody, it, have you ever had something take longer than you thought it should? Anyone ever had stuff happen in your life that you think, oh my gosh. Anyone, anyone ever have detours in your life that maybe were not God planned? Maybe you kind of had something to do with that. But later you thought, mm, wasn't good. I'm not using the word sin. You can use that yourself. But anybody ever had something happen that you, you know. I love the fact that 
the gifts and calling of God without repentance. I love the fact that you can get God's forgiveness if you just ask Him. And you can pick up right there, right where you left off. Here's Jesus meeting somebody else's need, and guess what? He was able to switch and get right back to Jairus. But notice this, and I know we've all been there before. It says there, after she got healed, this woman with the issue of blood, verse 35, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and said this, your daughter is dead. Why are you bothering the teacher anymore? You know, things went from bad, and now in Jairus' little way of thinking, they're worse. She was just sick, really, really sick. Now she's no longer sick. She's dead. And now people are saying, well, what are you bothering him for? You got stuff to tend to. You better get back home. Folks, don't allow your circumstances to steal from you your faith of what you're believing God for. Look what happened here. Ignoring what they said, verse 36. Ignoring what they said. Ignoring what they said. Ignoring what they said. Folks, the problem is a lot of times we're not ignoring the right things that people say. Sometimes we're paying too much attention to what some people are saying. And obviously not enough to some other things that we ought to be paying attention to. The problem of time is you are a product of what you've heard, of what you're hearing, and what you will hear. If you put something in your mouth that isn't bad, your body's going to tell you about it. Do I know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever eaten something that was bad? And your body was like, I don't want this in me. And your body has ways of getting things out of you. Doesn't it? And I mean, I'm talking some really powerful ways to get things out of you. I mean, some, I'm, I'm talking some real Greek ekbalo stuff here, okay? I mean, violently cast out of you. I'm just saying. Because it goes, this is not bad. I'm getting this out of me now with the express train. We as a believer need to have the same type of response to doubt and unbelief. If you got stuff that somebody has said to you that is affecting you, that is being put into you to rob from you that which God is developing, God, which God is building, and, and, and put a firm foundation in your life, and it's being uh, you know, uprooted and torn out, you need to take heed, as it were, and go back and say, no, I'm getting that out of me. I am not listening to this. I'm ignoring this. Yes. Problem is, you've got people put, putting stuff in you as if your ears... Are trash cans. They say, "Well, what does that put you put? Be very careful what you listen to. Be careful what you what you take heed about. Stop listening to gossip. Stop listening to, to the things that are doubt and unbelief. Be very careful about this stuff, because what happens is you become desensitized to things that you should not be." If, if sin ever becomes acceptable, then what you've done is you've desensitized yourself to the things of God. It's a product of what you've been listening to, of what you've allowed to come in your life. Stop that. Get that out of you. Just saying. Jesus said here, told them as it were, ignoring what they said, Jesus then told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Everybody say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, you're, you're, that is a response. The very idea of being afraid is a response to a circumstance. Be careful what your response is to a circumstance or something you might hear. Go back to what you know. Go back to what you believe. Go back to what you prayed. Go back to what you've been thanking God for. Has anything changed? Well, yeah, the certain No, no, no. Has anything really changed? Does the word still prevail over your circumstance? Yes. Then it really doesn't matter what the circumstance is. If the word prevails over it, 
then your faith is not in the circumstance changing. Your faith is in the word that will change whatever circumstance is prevailing. Let me say that again. Your faith is not in the circumstance changing. Your faith is in God's word that changes circumstances. If you put your faith in a circumstance changing, then when the circumstance looks bleaker, you've just now lost your faith. It's getting challenged and crumbled. No, I put my faith in the word of God. I put my faith in the Bible. I put my faith in what God said, what Jesus has said, that changes whatever circumstance happens to be momentarily prevailing. Because circumstances change dramatically. I said circumstances change dramatically. I remember somebody I knew from California back when I served out, you know, years ago as an associate pastor. And, and, and um, somebody that I, that I knew um, was dating somebody, dating this man. And um, they, you know, they, she was, and they, uh, this gentleman was a real estate agent. And, uh, you know, it was tough going, you know, trying to scrape by living as it were during that time. And having a difficult time there, and this other, this man here, you know, they they had just gone through a divorce, and he just it devastated something. It was infidelity, a lot of stuff involved, and uh, just devastated. And then everything changed, because what happened was he bought a dollar ticket, lottery ticket. Turned out he won a million dollars. And the beautiful thing about this was here he was thinking, how am I going to, I got all this stuff, you know, and he's having it. And now he's like, oh my gosh, this, this woman that he was married to, that had been unfaithful to him and abused him and just everything else you can imagine. Just all of a sudden he was just like, oh my gosh, I'm a millionaire and my ex-wife doesn't get a dime. <laughs> he was all thrilled. He was like. Isn't this great, God? And it was just a, it was just, and it was like, it was amazing how circumstances change just like that. He went from, oh my word, this is so, you know, whatever, to, but I'm, I'm, you know, being faithful to God. And also the next thing you know, he's like, God just took care of everything. Now I'm not advocating going out and buying a dollar lottery ticket, okay? I'm not advocating that. But what I am saying is. Your circumstances are subject to radical and dramatic change. Yes. And in one moment, they can be this way. In the next moment, everything's different. Yes. Why don't we use the principle of God to allow the Father to change those circumstances in our life? Yes. And Jesus was just letting them know, don't be afraid, just believe. You were believing when you came to me. Yes. You were believing when you told me the circumstances. You were believing that I could do something about it. You were believing when I said, let's go. So why don't you just keep believing? Verse 37 said, he didn't let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the house of the synagogue's ruler here, his house, his home, Jesus saw a great commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. That's just what they did. You know, they actually had people. I, this would be a job I would not want. They actually had people that you paid. To wail and cry. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm just saying, you know what? You have to be really hard up to, I mean, that'd be like, that's a job you really have to really think about hardly. Like, is this really the life choice I want to make? You have to cry and wail loudly for hours and hours and hours. But folks, we got people in our lives that act that way. We just call it drama now. Okay, just being, just, just, just tell you the truth. If you got people in your life that always cause drama, do yourself a favor. Change the locks. Okay, anyway. So they were all wailing and crying loudly. Verse 39, he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child's not dead, just sleeping. Then they laughed at him. But he put them all out. He took the child's father and mother and those disciples that were with him and went into where the child was. Now, why did he do that? He got rid of that unbelief. He got rid of all that drama. Folks, I'll tell you something, right? There are some things God will not be able to do in your life until you get the drama out of your life. Now, I'm just telling you, you treat that as a prophetic word in your, and it would help you. 
But there are, there, there's going to be things in your life God will not be able to bring to pass in your life until you get the drama out of your life. And that means choices and decisions on who you allow to have a voice into your life and the permission you give to people to have authority and power over your life. Okay. But they laughed at him and put them all out, took them as they said those people. And then he took the, this little girl by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately. Immediately. I mean, I'll tell you, I thank God he can still do immediately. It says immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. She got up and walked around. This is not walking dead stuff here, okay, folks? This is a live, living person raised from the dead. And it, it bears being said here, because it says it in the word here in verse 42, but it's pretty obvious. This is rather rhetorical. And at this, they were completely astonished. Yeah, I bet you those disciples were pretty astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Now people say, what do you mean give her something? She's probably hungry. After all, she's been dead for a while. You heard of being dead tired, she was dead hungry. But this is something else that tells me something about Jesus. He cares about every part of your life. You know, he cares about, you know, think about that, he was like, no, that poor girl's hungry, give her something to eat. thinks of stuff like this Jesus he's got everything figured out he knows he cares about every facet of your life even the stuff that you just can't even think about or imagine he cares about it it matters to him so he said there what he said give her something to eat I look at this story and it just shows to me the compassion of Jesus as much as his power his ability there is so much you can learn from this little passage about how you and I can accord our life in such a way of faith that we can eschew the doubt and unbelief. Surround ourselves with people who are at least in your corner. Why do you think Jesus took, as it were, those three disciples in? Not even the others. They were the closest to him. Same ones that later you find out were with him in other periods of his life. Folks, I'll tell you something. There's going to be people in your life that you're just closer to. Spiritually. Keep these people close. Keep these people in your life. You know, it, it, Jesus is teaching us so much about living a life of faith. And yet, sadly, we've got so much out there that's trying to rob us from the privilege and awesome opportunity of walking and living by faith. And we're letting, letting that stuff just steal it from us. You see, I've said this before and I'll say it again to you. That, 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 that afraid, that fear that you have that sometimes wants to come upon you, that doubt that tries to come in your mind that, that this isn't going to work, all that fear is is the product of your senses coming to the conclusion that basically you don't have what it takes to, 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 to control this circumstance or situation. Folks, I'll tell you something. Don't let your feelings rob from you that blessing right from the very throne room of God. Jairus was already believing that she was going to live, that she was going to come back. That's why he went to Jesus. Why do you stop midstream, mid-miracle, and give it up because you heard something that did not align itself with what you were believing? Somebody tells you, oh, you're not saved. I had somebody once tell me years ago, that, I mean many, many years ago, that, that I wasn't saved. I said, what do you mean I'm not saved? I wasn't in their church. They were part of a church that believed that you had to be a part of their church or you weren't going to heaven. And I said, well, you know, sorry. I had somebody else many, many years ago tell me that... Uh, that miracles were done away with with the death of the last apostle. Oh, there were miracles in the Bible, but once the last apostle died, they all went away. 
And I told him, well, the last apostle is the first apostle, and that's Jesus Christ, and his word is forever the same. And I said, sorry, you're too late. What do you mean? Maybe if you had gotten a hold of me 20 years earlier, you might have had a chance for me to live in that type of doubt and unbelief. But you see, I know better now. And because I know better, it's not working. All I'm trying to tell you is the things that no one could convince you of, that you'd sit there and laugh out like they're crazy. That's how you need to feel about some of the things that people try to put doubt and unbelief in your life. If I came up to you and I started saying, um, you know, um, hey, Brother Wayne, you're a woman. <laughs> he didn't know that or not, but you know what? Yeah, you're not really a man. You're a woman. You've been a woman all your life. And you sit there thinking, this guy is nuts. He's crazy. That's lunacy. But you know better, right? Nobody's going to convince you you're a woman. Right? <laughs> Nobody's going to convince you you're a woman, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You'd sit there and laugh it off. Folks, that's the response we need to have to doubt and unbelief. Why are you struggling with it? Why do you take it seriously? I mean, do you get what I'm saying to you? If somebody told you, okay, hey, by the way, just wanted to just let you know for sure you're going to hell. You'd sit there and think, that guy's crazy. What do you mean? I know. You ask me how I know he, li he lives. He lives within my heart. You know these things. You just, it wouldn't even bother. You would like, whatever. That's how we need to treat purveyors of doubt and unbelief. When a doubt comes again, you go, know, you know, one of my sayings, I've said it for years, I'll say it again. You, you get the point where you can start saying this more regularly, God's got this. God's got this. God's got this. God's got this. See, the problem is we're not, we're, we're you know, you, you try to rationalize things. Well, you know, I, God's got this. I told you I had a doctor, you know, a few years ago. I had a doctor, I mean, God, he's a Christian, good guy. But I had a doctor tell me, you know, came in there and said, you know, Jack, I think what we're going to, have, you know, do is I think we're going to have to do a total bone marrow replacement on you. Irradiate your body and kill all the bone marrow and put some new bone marrow in you. And I looked at him and I just said, well, if that's your best idea, you better come up with another one. But you're not doing that. He said, what do you mean? I said, you don't have any idea. You're just throwing, you're just throwing things. Out. I said, no, it's not what's going to happen. They didn't have to do it. They didn't do it. I mean, it was crazy, crazy talk. Well, he got a hold of himself. Oh, no, we don't need to do that. Yeah, you're right. Well, I'm believing God. Anyway. Just understand that if I can say it this way, your, your, your faith does not produce a feeling. Okay? It produces a fact. So, you know, you, you know, you just elevate your faith above your feelings. Above the drama. Be careful what you allow in your life. Be careful what you heed yourself to. Take heed what you hear. Take those dreams and dust them off now. Some promises you have, get that dust off of them. Refortify your efforts. Start thanking God for it. Realize that Jesus already said, let's go. Let's go. Let's go take care of that. What he's saying is he's for you. You don't have to beg him for it. He wants it. He wants it for you. He's working on it. Don't doubt it. Well, I don't know. The circumstances don't look good. It's like, Jairus, your daughter's dead. Why trouble you, the master, the teacher anymore? That has no bearing on anything. I'm believing what the word says. My faith is not in the circumstance changing. My faith is in the word that changes my circumstance. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I see our time is up. I've gone way over time. For those of you joining us online, I, I appreciate your, your patience. Those of you here with us on, you know, here in person, I appreciate your patience as well. But I hope you got something out of this today. I'm trying to encourage you when it comes to faith 
in some practical ways because people have made this so complicated and it's not. It's simple, but it has to be, these principles have to be obeyed. When Jesus told us about faith, he was so that we could do it. We could live by it. We could operate in it. It was not just something that we should aspire to that maybe a few get it. This is something that for all of us, the just shall live by faith. The just means the declared righteous. How many declared righteous do we have here? Hopefully all of you. If you're Christians, you're declared righteous. He wants us to live by faith. And aren't you glad? We are in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for all the goodness and the mercy you've shown in our hearts. And we thank you, Father, for the provision of walking in faith. Help us to take heed to these principles. I pray that there was something that was spoken that is, that is relevant for our lives, that needs to be believed and acted upon. Because, Father, I know that your desire is to, is to allow our lives to be, have, have a life of significance, for our life to make a difference, to live above the, 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 the mediocrity of this world, to help influence the lives of others for you. Help us, Father, to understand and embrace the fact that you are good all the time, that your mercy is enduring forever. But we choose to be willing and obedient. Father, help us not to laugh at your promise. Help us, Father, to never scoff at any word that's in your word. Help us, Father, to never lose heart, to faint or give up. When a promise is received, Father, we thank you. That is your solemn promise to bring it to pass in our lives. We act in faith. We move and live and have our being in you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Yes. Father, you said in your word that whoever would believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus would be saved. If we would call, you would answer. Father, we thank you that I pray if there's anybody that has not yet turned the control of their life over to you, Jesus, that right now they're asking you to come into their hearts. They're saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Forgive me of my sins, my mistakes, the things that were done wrong, and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Fill me with your spirit, Father. You see, Father, if, if anyone would just make that plea to you, that prayer to you, you would answer, respond, and bless. Father, we thank you. We honor you. And we glorify your name above every name. For we ask this thing in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Well, for those of you that are joining us online, I trust you have a wonderfully blessed day. If there's something we can do to help you out, I hope you call us, contact us. Information's on the screen. If you'd like to be a blessing to us in, in a financial way, we appreciate it so very much. That information's on the screen as well, how you could do that. And I just remind you again, God cares about you. Use the faith that God gives you. Use that trust and confidence for the purpose that, that God has intended. And never look at yourself as being a have-not. You are a have. Because you know why? Because you are possessed by God, filled with the Holy Ghost, infused with his love, and you walk in his love. And I praise God for each and every day that we can live for him and see his bounty and provision manifested in our midst. Well, I'll just let you go now. Have a blessed day. We'll see you back here Wednesday night at 7 o'clock Central Time. And as I try to remind you, God loves you. And remember, Jesus is Lord. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye now.